We're jumping into a series through the book of Nehemiah, and for this first chapter, I called the sermon I preached on this section, God's Name and Fame. Now, the book of Nehemiah takes place towards the end of Old Testament history, so the year, the twelfth year of King Artaxerxes is the year 445 B.C., if you want to get yourself familiarized with what we've seen just before the book of Nehemiah, in the original uh, Hebrew Bible, Ezra and Nehemiah were one book. And last year I worked through the book of Ezra. So you could go and search those videos where I've done the text work on the book of Ezra last year. And that will give you a good foundation uh, flowing into what we see here in Nehemiah chapter 1. The gap between the end of the book of Ezra and Nehemiah is uh, 13 years. So it's been 13 years since Ezra the priest returned. The temple in Jerusalem has been rebuilt. But what we'll see in the book of Nehemiah is that things weren't great. Um, they had been deported by the Babylonians back in 586 BC. And you can read all about that background in the book of Daniel. But in 539 BC, God had raised up Cyrus, who sent the first of God's people home. They had started the work of restoring the people, restoring the temple, but things still weren't great. And God's promises hadn't been fully fulfilled yet. And that's where we come to in Nehemiah chapter 1. As always, I do encourage you to read this chapter yourself a number of times. Just familiarize yourself, look out for repetition, look out for important ideas. Spend time praying that God would help you to understand his word so that it will challenge your own heart and stir you. And if you're teaching this to others, that you'd be equipped to do that well. Obviously, the namesake of this book is Nehemiah himself. And Nehemiah's name means uh, God wipes away tears or God comforts. So his name is linked with the great promises of God in Isaiah's prophecy. Isaiah had promised a day when God himself would wipe all tears from all eyes. And Nehemiah's name is pointing ahead to that. But what we see in chapter 3 is that God's people have many tears in their eyes because they are in great trouble and disgrace. They're in great trouble and disgrace. And the wall of Jerusalem is broken the gates are burned with fire. And as a result of this, God's people in Jerusalem would have been crying. It's a terrible report that Nehemiah gets. Some other important background information to know. So he's in the citadel of Susa, which is um, in the Persian Empire. He is what we'll see in chapter 2, the cupbearer of King Artaxerxes, who was the king of Persia. So he's far away from Jerusalem, 1,600 kilometers away from Jerusalem. But a very important thing to note is when it comes to Jerusalem, Jerusalem was the city where God's name and fame were linked. God's people could point to Jerusalem and say, this is the city of our God. They could point to the temple and say, our God lives with us. But Nehemiah got this report saying actually the people there are in great disgrace. The walls are broken. The gates are burned by fire. So this place in which God's name and fame were meant to be raised on high was in disrepair. It was in ruins, which meant that God's name in all the earth wasn't being held high or it wasn't in the city of Jerusalem. And the first thing that we see Nehemiah do is he prays. And something we'll see in Nehemiah a number of times is that he is a man of prayer. He's a prayerfully dependent man. And what we see is because he knew who he was praying to. He prayed before the God of heaven. And if you see what he calls the Lord, the great and awesome God, the promise, covenant, promise-keeping God. And it's this God who Nehemiah prays to, to those who love him, who keep his commandments. 
He wants your ear and your eye to be on your people. So in response to this terrible news, Nehemiah prays this very God-focused prayer. And it's a prayer praising God for how great and awesome He is, which you see in the first few verses. And then it moves to a prayer of confession, where Nehemiah is saying, we have messed up. And he speaks about himself and the Israelites, and he lumps them all together. Um, Your servant and your servants, we Israelites, we've acted. So although God is the great and awesome God, the covenant-keeping God, and those covenant uh, promises are what are linked to the name of this God um, and linked to the city of Jerusalem where God was with his people. And so when Nehemiah hears that the city's in ruins, he's distraught because God's name and God's fame in the world are are not being held high as they should be. And he cries out, let your ear be attentive. Let your eyes see. Lord, please hear me. Because you are a God of covenant love. You are a God who redeems. And because those things are true, Lord, remember. So what we see in this prayer is this acknowledgement of who God is, Uh, This acknowledgement of who he is, he and his people are sinners. And then he prays the promises. He, He says, Lord, remember. Remember what you've said. Remember what you've done. He holds tightly to God's promises because he knows that God is somebody who keeps his covenant love. He will keep his promises. So he prays those promises back. And only after praying those promises back to God does he make his request saying, Lord, give success, grant favor. Let your ear be attentive. And again here, let your ear be attentive. Lord, hear us. This prayer shows that Nehemiah was somebody who revered God's name. He had a a deep reverence for God's name and a desire to see God's covenant promises fulfilled. And that then drove him to his knees. He prayed. He prayed to this God. He said, Lord, please act. Give us success. Give me favor. Because he was about to go and ask this king, the most powerful man on the planet at that time, to do something that would be crazy to ask under normal circumstances. And we'll dig into that in chapter 2. But before we see any of the action of Nehemiah, uh, uh, the rest of the chapters, we see Nehemiah begins in prayer. Nehemiah wanted to see his people restored, he wanted to see his city restored, all because he wanted God's name to be revered in all the earth. He wanted God's name and fame to be held high. He didn't want his people to have tears in their eyes, to be in trouble and disgrace, and for Jerusalem to be in ruins, because God's name was linked to his people. It was linked to his place. Something we'll see about Nehemiah is that he understood God's word very well, And here he actually quotes from Deuteronomy 4, um, 25 to 31. And it just shows where he says, Lord, remember, remember. Um, Just as you promised that if your people turn back to you, you will remember your covenant promises. Um, If they are unfaithful, you've scattered them. That's what's happened, Lord. That's why we're in Persia. But if we return to you, then you promised. You promised, Lord, to bring us back, to restore And we revere you, Lord, to make your name great again by bringing us back, by restoring your city. And that's what we're going to see in Nehemiah driving towards in the rest of this book. And this chapter just kind of sets the foundation for that. But it's important for us to think before we move on, does this mean that we, like Nehemiah, should be praying to the awesome God of heaven for Jerusalem and for the walls that are broken down? 
We need to remember that in Jesus, the focus where God's name and fame are held high are no longer focused on the city of Jerusalem. They're now focused on the person of Jesus. And Jesus was the one who Nehemiah was wanting to prepare the way for because he knew that a promised king would come who would sit on David's throne. That promise was in Jerusalem. But what he didn't know is that promise would become much bigger than just focused on Jerusalem. In Christ, all people who trust in Jesus for salvation are now the people who who hold God's name and fame high. And so this chapter should also drive us to be a people who look to the God of heaven, who is great and awesome, who confess our sins and who ask God to remember his promises. And one of those promises is that God has promised to build his church. We should want to see God's church being built today. And so we should be praying, crying out to God that he would continue to build his church as he's promised to do for his glory. And as we go through Nehemiah, we'll see God doing amazing things back in that day. And that will remind us that the same God who was at work establishing a people for himself, a city for himself, which would prepare the way for the coming Messiah, is the same God who is at work in the world today, establishing a people for himself as we wait for Jesus to return. Well, God bless as you dig in further, and may this stir you to be among those who hold God's name and fame high. Mm -hmm.